This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. Well, it's good to be back up here. It feels like it's been a long time, but it's just been a week. I appreciate Roy, the word he gave last week, and uh, he set the bar really high for me. 25-minute sermon. Wow. All right. I, probably not going to happen. But uh, it was a great sermon. He did a great job of wrapping up Habakkuk, and I appreciate it. It really was a, a super good word. If you, didn't, if you weren't here last week, I would go back and listen to it. I've asked Malia to come help me with an illustration here to start off the morning. So Malia gets here bright and early with her dad for deacon duty, and she was here, and I told her, I didn't tell her what we were going to talk about, and, but I said that I needed her to come up here, and, and, and Jeremy, if you can give her a little microphone right here. I'll turn mine off. How about that? We'll just share. So... Uh, Malia has no idea why you're here, right? Just going to ask you some questions, right? So I, I, I want to tell you about what happened with me last week. And while I was gone, you knew, you probably didn't know I was gone, did you? Okay. All right. She didn't know. Yeah. Okay. You kind of did. Okay. Kind of remember. Okay. So I took a trip to the moon. No, you did not do that. What? How do you know that? You would need a rocket ship. Well, you know, my buddy Elon, you know, he has a rocket ship. And so, yeah, we kind of headed off to the moon for a couple of days and came back. You think, you think I'm telling the truth? You have to give me some proof so I can know that's true or not. That's, that's a great question. Yeah, give some proof, right? Yeah, so, so you believe me if I, if I brought some dirt in here from the moon and said, hey, I got some, uh, some moon dust? Maybe. No, probably not, right? So what's the choices here, all right? I put the choices on the screen. Look at the screen here. All right, we could, I'm, either, I'm either a liar, all right? So I'm just telling you a lie, and you're just like, you know, I'm not telling the truth, all right? Or I'm crazy. I'm a lunatic, right? You know what a lunatic is? Somebody who thinks they're right, but they're really crazy and not right, right? They, like a lunatic is basically like, I think, yeah. Be careful what you say here, all right? How about we just move on? Or, or I'm a lunar traveler, right? So, so which one am I? Do you think I'm, I'm a liar that I'm just lying and saying I went to the moon? Do you think I'm just crazy that I'm not all right? There's something wrong with my brain, and I think I went there, but I really didn't go there. Or do you think I actually I traveled to the moon? Which one would you guess? Liar. All right. You're probably right. Yeah, you are right. All right, thank you. Give Malia a hand, all right? Thank you. So what's the point of that? So when it comes to Jesus Christ, and many of you, I've used this illustration before, C.S. Lewis talked about how that Jesus, you have to do something about Jesus. You cannot just be neutral when it comes to Jesus Christ and what you believe about him. If you look in the word and you see his claims, like the claim, go ahead to the next screen, Liz, uh, Liz uh, if you can put the next one up. He says, I and the Father are one. So Jesus made many big, bold claims about himself, and this is a significant claim that he said that me and God the Father, we are the same person. In essence, in, uh, in, in character and in spirit, in, from the beginning I was there, at, at John started off his gospel, but in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And so either Jesus is like I was, a liar that is claiming something, but he just knew that he was just spreading lies and misinformation that he was not truly Jesus the Messiah, or he was crazy. He just was delusional. He thought he was God, and he was mentally insane, and he was making these claims. Or the third option is he's really Lord. He was telling the truth. So C.S. Lewis laid this down, and he said, logically, you have to decide which one of these you are when it comes to your perspective with Jesus. Because you can't say well, Jesus was a decent person. He was a pretty cool man. He was a pretty amazing prophet. And then look at the words that we recorded, the scriptures that record Jesus' teaching and these claims like, I and the Father are one. And you can't walk away and saying Jesus is a prophet because that doesn't make sense, right? How can he be a, a prophet but lie all the time, right? He could not be a legitimate prophet of God. And, he, and, you know, was Jesus crazy? Did he make these claims? You can't believe that he was a good man, that he was a strong historical figure who made a difference and made an impact on the world because of his good teaching, yet believe he's crazy at the same time. There's a problem there. 
And so C.S. Lewis said, you have to come to the conclusion of who Jesus truly is. And the Gospel of John, which we're going to launch into today, the, I mean, I'm sorry, the first John, the epistle of first John, which we're going to launch into today, is all about the deity and incarnation, which is another a fancy word for meaning that God came to earth and took on the form of a man, lived as a man, all man, all God. The, the, the foundational teaching of Jesus' incarnation, that John has to deal with this, and he's dealing with it right off the bat. We're talking about first century, right? We're, we're still in the first century when John's writing this epistle. And right off the bat, people are questioning Jesus and who he is. And so he's dealing with this truth is, is, let me tell you who Jesus really is. And this is, again, it's nothing new. Today, people question Jesus. They questioned him back then. At the time of John's writing, more than likely, he was probably the only of the 12 still living. The 12 disciples, the apostles of Jesus, he's probably the only one that's still living. He's a very old man at this point, And it's very important that he sets the record straight that this is who Jesus was, who he declares Jesus to be in this epistle. And many people up to this point in Christianity, we're talking about maybe 50 to 60 years after Jesus, many people had converted to Christianity. Many people had turned to Jesus. There were many Jews who turned away from Judaism and turned to Christianity. And I say turned away, they would have seen this as a continuation, but for the, the mainstream religious establishment. This was a turning away of Judaism. And there were many Gentiles who at this point had put their faith in Jesus. There were many churches uh, throughout the Roman Empire uh, at this point. And so there was a lot that had happened. The faith had spread. And Satan's strategy was immediately to get people confused over who Jesus is. And that strategy continues to play out to this day. Who is Jesus? God, man? What is he? Was he a good guy? Was he a prophet? And so John is setting the record straight in 1 John. He says, I witnessed Jesus. And that's where he starts off in these first verses in 1 John. He said, I was there with Jesus. I can tell you what Jesus was like. And all the evidence that we have internally from the book and also other things that were written during this time period point to what was called, again, another fancy word. You don't need to remember this word or anything, but it's called Gnosticism, early, early Gnosticism. wouldn't even be called Gnosticism at this point. That's from a word that means knowledge. And if it matters to you, it was Docetism is the technical term of this. And they taught that Jesus was human, then the spirit of Christ, the Messiah, came upon him, descended upon him at baptism. And it was the spirit of Christ that then empowered Jesus for ministry. I know that sounds confusing to us because we've been raised in a tradition where Jesus was the God-man. But they, these false teachers were coming into these churches. These people were confusing others about who Jesus was. And they said that just before Jesus' crucifixion, the spirit of Christ, Christ's spirit, departed from the man Jesus. And then Jesus was the one who died on the cross, not the Messiah. So while Jesus died, Christ neither suffered nor did he, was he on, died on the cross. So there was this basically a separation between the, the human side of Jesus because they taught that human and flesh and blood could do no good. It was evil. So not to confuse you with too much, but that's going to be the background that streams throughout this book is this false teaching and this false belief. And you'll see right off the bat how that comes into play. So Paul, or I'm sorry, John isn't writing to confront these false teachers but he's writing to build up the church, build up these people who are faithful within the church. And so we'll talk more about that in a second. So let's look at these first four verses of 1 John chapter 1. John writes, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it. And testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you. So that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So let's pause and pray and then we'll look at this passage. 
Father God, we thank you for your word that gives us truth. And God, I pray for those in here who are struggling to process uh, religion, faith, Jesus. They're seeking, they're here because somebody brought them here, they're here by accident, they're here, uh, God, for various reasons, and they don't have a relationship with you, God. May today they see that they must make a decision about historical Jesus, the Jesus who lived and walked on this planet. God, for those of us who have been believers for a period of time, God, I pray you'll encourage us today. It's so easy in this life to take our eyes off of Jesus, so easy to just be captivated with the stuff of this earth and this world. And God, I pray you'll remind us today of why we're here. And God, may we walk out of here with greater joy to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So the false teaching that I just described led to these house churches, and John would have been over this network of house churches, probably in the area of Ephesus, around that area. And so this false teaching has come into this church, and at this point, the book is written to these believers because a group of these people now have split off from the church. They've left the church, and so John is dealing with this fallout that happened and these departures that happened from the church community, the faith community. We see this clearly in chapter 2, verse 19, where John writes, they, talking about the false teachers, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. And so there's this church split that happens. And if you've been in church for most of your life and you've lived life at least as long as me, you've probably been involved in a church split. It's a very painful thing. People get in the flesh. They can't get along. Various things happen. And so churches sometimes divide. But if you've ever been in a church or in a relationship with someone who it's dividing over something that's very serious, very central, like the nature of Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ, you're talking about a whole different level, right? I mean, most of the time, churches split over silly things. But if something has caused, an essential belief has caused a split in the church, that's extra painful because you realize that the people are in danger because their salvation does not seem genuine and real. Today, the word that people use for those who are struggling and maybe considering denying their faith is they're deconstructing their faith. Maybe you've heard that term before. They're doing religious deconstruction, and it's kind of a thing with the internet now. People go, and there's groups, and there's hashtags, deconstruction, and some famous evangelical pastors have deconstructed their faith, and it's, it's a really, really sad thing to watch, and especially if it's somebody, again, somebody you love or your own child that this has happened. And I'm going to just like pause for a second here because I think it's really important sometimes that we just talk to parents because the home is really where the faith battle takes place. That's the front lines. And I've said this many times over the years as your pastor, and I really gleaned this as my years as a youth pastor, that when we live out our faith at home as parents, that is the best way for your children to really catch your faith and own their faith for themselves. I mean, I saw it year after year in youth ministry that kids who abandoned their faith, who ran off and did dif- different thing, the, the home life, if you examine the home life, there was no talk of Jesus in the home. It was a very much a compartmentalized, we go to church, we do the religious stuff, but at home, like, we don't talk about that kind of stuff. And usually it's because dads are they feel insecure about saying Jesus and talking about Jesus. They feel like they're not experts, and the experts are at church to teach their children. And so I encourage you to live out your faith at home. Talk about Jesus at home. Be specific. Be intentional with those talks. And then also, years ago, I came across a very helpful article that I have shared over the years with you that I think is very good for those who maybe you're dealing with somebody, particularly a son or a daughter, who is going through this deconstruction or they're starting to question their faith. And this was a very helpful article. The first thing it says is don't panic, all right? Sometimes we can panic. We get very insecure when we hear our children say, I'm questioning what you taught me. Like, I'm not really sure I believe that anymore. And this can be something, I mean, it doesn't even have to be the essentials of the faith. We just feel very like our kids are, what's going on here when they begin to question some things that are probably on the peripheral uh, side of things. But we'll talk about that more in in a moment. So don't panic. Don't freak out about it. 
And then avoid bundling your faith. I would encourage you parents to be very careful that you don't tie your faith so closely to your political identifications, your political loyalties, or yet, no matter what the things is that, that you exalt or the things that are lifted up in your house, even if it's sports, don't bundle your faith so tightly with these other things where uh, that your kids feel like to own their faith, they have to own all these other beliefs that you have. Okay? Keep this, the essential things the essential things. And so don't let these things uh, bleed out onto the thing that is truly imper- important. In, in the membership class, we talk about the bullseye. And we talk about these are the essentials. And these are the things that outside of these essentials of salvation and orthodoxy, outside here now, these things can be disagreed upon. We can agree to disagree on these things. So don't make the huge deal about the things that are not the essential things. And then for adult children, I would encourage you to resist the temptation to constantly pass along information, forward them things, text emails, and constantly bombarding them with, you know, here's a good article I found that you should read. I, I, I think the best thing to do is just listen well to them. Really pay attention to the things they're saying. Have really deep and good conversations with them as they bring up these things. And don't make this all about yourself. As I said, we can be very insecure and we can get defensive that's not the way we raised you, right? And I remember my, my dad was a, a wonderful Christian guy. I mean, he really was. And, but they were, very, they were very rooted in a certain tradition. They were saved in this tradition. They grew up in this tradition. That's all they knew. And so I remember the first time that, in, that we went to Dallas. We went to Dallas, and I became on staff with a non-denominational church. And he really struggled with that because he's like, you were raised Baptist, right? Why are you leaving? To, you know, what's wrong with Baptist? And he took it very personal that I wasn't in a Baptist church for a while. It took him a little while to come around. But that's sometimes normal for us to respond in a passionate way about things that aren't that essential. So don't make this about you. And so it's very important to understand that when somebody starts to question things, have that conversation. Have that dialogue. So parents, put that in your memory bank. Remember that. Take a screenshot of the uh, screen up here, a picture of the screen, and remember these things. So people in John's church, they they begin to deconstruct their beliefs about Jesus. And they left John's churches that he was a pastoring over these churches. And they claimed they could still have fellowship with God, but have different views on Jesus. And then additionally, they began to really, it looks like, bully those who would not go along with their cause and act very unloving toward these people. So John, again, primarily writes to strengthen the confidence of those who have remained faithful not to confront these people who deserted, these people who left the church. We see this in chapter 2, verse 26. This verse will be on the screen. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. So he's writing to the church. So John is pastoring these people. He's loving them well, but he doesn't shy away from confrontation. In fact, in this book, we will see that he refers to these people as false prophets, deceivers, even uses the word in chapter 2, antichrist, because the substance of their teaching is to deny that Jesus was both God and man. That's why he wrote verse 2 of chapter 4, where he says, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. So these people were denying Jesus had come in the flesh, this, this warped way of thinking. And 1 John can be a very difficult book at times. I know many of you do Bible read-throughs. Sometimes we can read through the Bible and just miss things. I remember when I looked at Habakkuk a few months ago and like, I want to really preach this book, but I really didn't have much recollection when I read through it because you're just kind of reading and you're going through, but you're not making huge notes about it and remembering important things. 1 John can be very difficult. And if you've ever heard a preacher preach on 1 John or a speaker, you know, somebody talk about 1 John, oftentimes they come with this perspective that this book is a test. I want to test you to see if you're really a Christian or not. John's testing us. And I really think uh, the approach is different. I'm going to say more about that in a second. I don't think these things are a test. People are loved and respect and listened to, feel like they are. I don't think so. But what makes John so difficult is 
that he's not writing in a way that's very like like one point after another. If you've ever tried to outline a speaker and you know you put down their heading and then subpoints and subpoints, well, if you were to outline John's book, it'd be very very difficult to do because he doesn't really follow this uh, linear course. It's straight the straight line. What he does is it's kind of like one commentator said. It's like a winding staircase that continues to go around the same center and return to the same topics, but deeper and deeper each time. And then there's a lot of parallelism, parallelism in the book, Christ versus Antichrist, light versus darkness, truth versus false, falsehood, righteousness versus sin, love of the Father versus love of the world, the Spirit of God versus the Spirit of the Antichrist. And so this book is very black and white, and it's these strong statements about what a Christian should look like. And again, I've, I've struggled with this because if you think of these as tests, when you see verses like this and you begin to examine yourself, how do you feel? No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. What are you going to do about that? What do you think about that in light of those sins of your life that you've been trying your best over the years to get victory over, but you just can't quite ever manage full victory? You just keep struggling and keep crying out to God for deliverance but it hasn't happened. What do you do? Do you say, whoa, I failed that test, so I'm, maybe, I'm, I'm probably not a Christian there. Or verse 10 of chapter 3, by this it is evident that we are children of God and who the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not from God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. What degree of love do you have there, right? If you're going on vacation and your neighbor says, I really need you to stay and help me because I'm really struggling. My wife's sick. Will you give up your vacation for me? And you're like, no, I'm not going to do that, right? Do you love your neighbor as much as you love yourself, right? And so when these subjective things come into play, it's very hard if we look at this as like a test. Like we feel like we're, we're failing and we're doubting. And I don't think that's the point because the background again here is the fact that John is writing to those who have remained faithful in the church. Those who have stayed and said, we believe in the biblical historical Jesus. We believe in the Jesus that you've taught us. And so John claims, claims that his purpose in chapter 5 is to assure his readers of their salvation. Look at verse 13 of chapter 5. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. So he's saying, you all believe that you may know that you have eternal life. So he's writing them for assurance of salvation. He's, he's saying them to them, look, you are those who believe. You have passed the test. So I believe that John is intended to assure those who remain that they have already passed the test of continuing in Christ, even while others have left, abandoned, and turned away. One commentator writes this. He says, John's letter is a publication of this church's victory. They are victors because they know Jesus is the Messiah. They know Jesus is a Messiah. And so what a refreshing way to look at the book, this book, because we see that those who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus, however imperfectly you're living out this and you're striving through the power of the Spirit and the effort the Spirit gives you to be who God says you're, you already are in Christ, that, that you come across certain verses and you're thinking, wow, I'm struggling. Am I really a Christian? And I don't believe that's the point of this. Our faith is firmly in Jesus. And you don't go to hell believing in Jesus, do you? If your faith and trust is in Jesus, you can rest in that. And so some come from faith traditions where you lose your salvation and you do you know, bad things. And so God kicks you out and he's, you're not his kid anymore. And you know, God doesn't do that. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. He has made you new. He has given you his spirit and he lives in you. And so the spirit who works within us desires holiness, desires that we live righteously. And he's empowering us to do that. And that battle, I, I've said this a lot too, that battle that we have, that a believer, when you do sin, how you feel about that. You know that you're not living out who you are in Christ. You're not living out that identity. But those who can just live their lives in whatever way and feel maybe some mild uh, guilt at a sermon or when you're you know, hearing something said and then you walk out and continue to live your life however way you want to live it, that's not what we're talking about here. You should have doubts about your salvation. But those who long to pursue and follow Jesus because Jesus is within you 
and he loves you and you're basking in his love and you're reflecting on his love, you know you have confidence that you're in him. And so John is writing and he's, he's telling this church, I'm writing these things so you can know that you have eternal life. So let's look at the passage, verse, the first four verses very quickly here. Number one, he again reiterates in these verses that Jesus is both divine, he's both God and he's both human. Very important. Look what he says. That which is from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life. What, what's it say next? Which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. So he says Jesus was with the Father. He's, in, he's the same essence of God himself. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard and proclaimed to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and what? And his Son, Jesus Christ. So Jesus is eternal. There's never been a time that Jesus did not exist. It's really important that we understand that. I, I know for those who come to church week in and week out, like, okay, I know that, right? But there are people here who need to hear that, that Jesus was fully man, fully God. He came from God from the beginning. He was with God. And so he, there was never a time when Jesus did not exist. And then he was human. And this is a firsthand eyewitness account from John. He's not passing on something he heard from somebody else. He's writing a historical record. He says, we heard him with our ears. And he repeats this again in verse 3 just to emphasize it. He says, we saw him with our eyes. John states three times for emphasis and he says that we have observed him. For three years, John watched Jesus, interacted with Jesus, listened to Jesus teach. He touched Jesus, says with his hands, he was real flesh and blood human being. He wasn't a ghost. He wasn't a phantom. He was a real human being. And God declared his existence in flesh and blood in Jesus Christ. And John knew that Jesus. John knew him personally. And John, you may not realize this because we think of John, he was the beloved disciple and he laid his head on Jesus' chest at the Last Supper. But he was the son of thunder, right? James and John, the sons of thunder. He was a wild, crazy man before he came to Jesus. And when he came to Jesus, Jesus changed him. He watched Jesus be humble and kneel down and wash the disciples' feet he saw Jesus die upon the cross. He was standing there as Jesus died. He touched, talked, and ate with Jesus. And most importantly, he saw the resurrected Jesus, interacted with the resurrected Jesus. John was an eyewitness. He was there. He witnessed it. Second, verse 3, through Jesus' coming, John has obtained fellowship or friendship with Jesus and God, his Father. Look at verse 3. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, where is his fellowship? Our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. This is not for those who left the church and abandoned the church, abandoned the fellowship. This is for those who stayed faithful. He says, our fellowship is with the Father and with Jesus Christ. And then he turns around and he says, so that you too may have fellowship with us. Those who stay true to Jesus share life with John and the other eyewitnesses of Jesus. He uses the word us. John is talking about himself and the other apostles who were eyewitnesses to Jesus. What I say earlier that John more than likely was the last living disciple, right? The last living disciple. So he's saying and, and what he is able to tell his audience is the same thing that we can share and say today. We can have real relationship and fellowship with the apostles, just like this first century church could have with the other apostles who had been martyred and killed for their faith because they have fellowship together with God. We're all in fellowship together. Maybe it's a way of, he's saying, you're in good company by staying true to Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying. Look at the company you're in. You're in with Peter, and you're in with me, John, and James, my brother. This is a company that you're keeping. Stay with the faith. Stay with the true church, because these are the people who are in fellowship with God. Tony Evans says it this way. He says, how can you, in the 21st century, hang out with the apostles 
to, so that you can have the same level of intimate fellowship with God that they enjoyed through studying the New Testament in general and 1 John in particular. I love that. So through the word, we have fellowship with the apostles. We have fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. And I think maybe some of you have a hard time wrapping your mind around that statement is because the word fellowship is a word that our culture has kind of like made not really what it was intended to be. I get this question a lot in membership class and also from those who have been here for a while, they're like, what's the K stand for in K group, right? Anybody ever get that question? And I was like, we thought that's how you spell community with a K. Not really. That's not what we thought. K stands for the Greek word koinonia. And koinonia is the Greek word that means fellowship. And fellowship speaks, uh, koinonia speaks of shared values, shared beliefs, shared goals. You're pursuing a common agenda. So sharing life together. And so that's how that we can share life with John and with James and with Jesus, because we are in his family. We are in his company. And so together with him, we have this relationship that has existed throughout the centuries. And so John's personal testimony about Jesus is that he is the God man. He is eternal flesh and bone, but he's also, he's came from God. He's God from the beginning. And the ultimate outcome is fellowship with God and this koinonia with the apostles. And then one final truth, one final purpose he mentions besides the fellowship. He says, a real relationship with Jesus and his apostles gives us eternal joy. John writes, and we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Our joy may be complete. He's, I think he's, to paraphrase it, you give us great joys because you remain faithful to the real Jesus. You remain faithful to the community of believers who are truly following the historical Jesus, the Jesus that I knew, the Jesus that I loved, the Jesus that I touched. And I think he, his use of ours could potentially include the readers, and your version may say, so that your joy may be complete. There's some disagreement over which word exactly, but I don't think it matters. The, the idea is that the joy that we experience, other places in the Bible talk about that, or John just knowing, well, I find great joy in the fact that my children are walking in the truth, right? My children in the faith continue to follow the truth of Jesus, and they're not abandoning us. They're not abandoning the true teaching. And so these first four verses show us that faith in the historical Jesus brings fellowship with God and others and it brings lasting joy, durable joy. This joy that he's talking about, complete, to be full, it goes on for eternity. We won't experience the fullness of joy in this life because of sin and because of the flesh. But he says, if you stick with Jesus, if you stay with Jesus, if you're truly in Christ, your joy will be full, it'll be complete, and it'll go on for eternity. And so John says, I witnessed it. I witnessed it. And what happens when you witness something? you're a witness to it, right? You witness something, you're a witness to that. And that's exactly what John is doing here. He says, I witnessed it, and so I'm a witness to it. I'm sharing it to the world. In fact, the apostles turned, literally turned the world upside down. We're sitting here today because of them spreading the message throughout the ends of the earth, right? And it will change you, and it will change your influence around those who you are. Spend your days and weeks and hours. It'll start with home. It'll start with your kids. It'll start with being free to talk about Jesus, maybe awkwardly at first for some of you, but you're willing to talk about Jesus. You're willing to say to your, your son, you know, I haven't been perfect. You know dad hasn't been perfect, but you know what? Dad loves Jesus, and I haven't done a very good job of sharing that with you through my, my lips and maybe not even through my actions, but I love Jesus. Things have changed in my life, and I want you to know that. And for those who have little kids, you're Constantly involved in their discipleship, you're sharing Christ with them, you're opening up about what God's teaching you, and you're being authentic and real at the home, in the home, because you're a witness to it. You're a witness to what Jesus has done. John was a witness, he shared. You're a witness, it impacts our lives so much that the Holy Spirit actually lives in you, and how can you not be a witness to that? How can you not just want to share the glories of Christ? 
And to kind of tie this together with verse 4, I want to end with a, a quote that I love, I use often by John Piper. It says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Having this real relationship with historical Jesus, the Jesus who walked this planet, who came from God, the Jesus who we can still have quinonia and fellowship with today, brings joy. And it's when we are satisfied and fulfilled and find our delight and we're building our life on Jesus, that joy is contagious. And that joy brings glory to God because people see there's something different about our lives. Not because God lines everything up and makes everything work out. It's because even when things don't work out that we understand that God is in control. And God has a reason and purpose that we may never understand, but we understand that he's in charge. So as you're struggling here today with maybe just your life and your circumstances and you're not finding much joy in it, do I have three points to give you that'll improve your life? No, I have one point. It's look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Remember who Jesus is. Remember the claims that he made, and they change everything because he's either a liar, he's a lunatic, or I think most of you would concede that he's Lord. So why are you not letting him be the Lord of your life? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for this book of 1 John, and we just are so eager to gleam the truths and to discover and see the things that you've revealed. Uh, God, for the church for many, many years, God, and we we thank you for these truths, that we can have koinonia, we can have fellowship, real fellowship with you and with one another around Jesus Christ because we're on the same page. We're going in the same direction. And God, I pray that you'll encourage those who don't feel like they're going on the, in the right direction, God. Those who are struggling, maybe they're in their own head, questioning things, deconstructing, or maybe it's just a physical or just a psychological things that are going on with them, God. I pray that you'll encourage them. God, help them to run to others in this church to find encouragement and strength. God, we need one another. We're in fellowship with one another. And God, I pray you'll help them to utilize the body of the church that you've given to them for their encouragement and benefit. And God, I pray you'll strengthen us. God, help us to keep our eyes on you so that our joy will truly bring glory to you and our d demeanor, our, 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 the way that we live our lives will truly reflect the reality of what's, what's happened in us and that your love has been poured out into us. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.